Hello, I'm Glenn Hall, and I'm going to begin a new series today called A Seamless Garment. I've been quiet about prophetic things now for almost a year. The Lord has had me stay quiet. Today is the first teaching video in some time. And I'm going to begin with the most reviled man in history. Who is the most reviled man in history? Is it some ages past political leader and great conqueror like Alexander the Great or Caesar? No, those men are deified. Those men are considered heroes in our world today. Could it be perhaps one of our most uh, recent tyrants like Adolf Hitler. Or before that, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, Napoleon. Of course, those men are reviled in some ways, but Napoleon has become a hero to many. Hitler is a hero to some. Today, many people, in fact, call conservatives Nazi, as if the Nazis, or the conservatives, I should say, deify Hitler. So the left, they revile Hitler, but only in order to score a political point. What about religious leaders? Is, uh, is Buddha reviled? Is Confucius reviled? Is Krishna reviled? Is Muhammad reviled? Who's ever heard anybody say, Buddha damn? Or Buddha damn you? Krishna damn you, or Muhammad damn you. Who's ever heard anyone curse someone in the name of Allah? Allah damn you. Oh, Allah. You ever heard that? What have you heard? God damn you. Jesus Christ. God damn Damn, Jesus Christ. Who can be more reviled than that? Over and over and over. And even by many who call themselves by his name, and he, even by many who call themselves Christians. How can it be that our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the most reviled man in history. How can it be? Well, what did the scriptures say about him? As I was contemplating this a few days ago, immediately I had this scripture and I want to go to the book of Philippians. So in Philippians chapter 3, the scripture that came to mind was the last part of verse 8. That said, verse 8 says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. The surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. That means nothing surpasses knowing Jesus. Nothing surpasses. 
He is the pearl of great price. He is so valuable that he told a rich young ruler to sell everything and follow him. He told the parable of this pearl of great price and said, if you find that in a field, bury it in the field and then go buy the field so that you can possess it. Do you yet possess this pearl of great price? The reason that Jesus is so reviled in the world is because the ruler of this world, namely Satan himself, and that is what the scriptures say, that's what the New Testament says, that Satan is still the ruler of this world. Jesus has not yet taken up the rulership of this kingdom. So the ruler of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of men so that we will not believe. He doesn't lead people to revile any of the other numerous religious figures. He doesn't lead people to revile men who died hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. There is one and only one who is reviled. And that is God himself. Let's look a little deeper into this passage from the book of Philippians. It adds such great understanding. Paul explains who he is, that he is a Hebrew among Hebrews. His pedigree was the best of the best of being a Pharisee and a Hebrew, of being of the tribe of Benjamin, of Israel, circumcised on the eighth day, and on and on. But then, as we get to verse 7, he says, But whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He's talking here, this is a little different than the usual uh, word for resurrection. The word ex or out occurs before that and many uh, people believe he's talking about the first fruits resurrection. The resurrection for the overcomers, the ones who will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in his kingdom when he comes. And you can look at that time when he comes in Revelation chapter 19. Paul goes on. Not that I have already obtained this. In other words, he has not obtained the resurrection yet, the out-resurrection, the resurrection for the overcomers, or that I am already perfect. See, he wants to be perfect, but he knows he's not yet perfect. And hopefully that's what you want. That's what I want. But I know I'm not yet perfect. I still sin, and it, it's a horrible fact of living in this flesh that we still sin but we ought not to want to sin our desires should be for the things of god and if we do sin we have an advocate namely jesus christ who died for our sins because my righteousness is based upon his righteousness not my own 
Paul again says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Okay, each of us attain. You know, I didn't begin here. There were things that I did and thought 41, 42 years ago when I first became a Christian that I don't think anymore. Things that I would have done then that I would not do now, but that isn't to say that there is no temptation in me even now or that there's no sin even now because that would be a lie. Temptation is always there and the possibility of falling profoundly in one day is always there. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. In other words, look to Christians who have walked the walk for a while. Look to Christians who have been faithful. Look to Christians who have been tempted, maybe have been tempted, but have repented and know what it means to know the grace of Jesus even after they sinned, after they were Christians. Look to men like that and follow their example. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, the Christian landscape is filled with failure. I cannot even tell you a church to go to because I don't know a good one to tell you to go to. When we look at the things we hear today about the church, when we hear about the gross failure, the pedophilia, the homosexual acts in the Catholic Church, for example, and soon to be revealed, I think, in many Protestant churches as well, we should become sick at heart. How do you trust yourself to a priest, a pastor, who is acting like that? You can't. You can't. How do you recommend people to go to churches who won't even stand up for righteousness sake, who will not stand up publicly against abortion, against homosexual rights, against transsexual foolishness? How do you go to churches that will not stand up for truth and will say, we accept everybody. Oh, really? You will accept everybody? Well, let me take you to a scripture that I don't think I've ever heard anybody preach on in my life. And then we'll go back here to the book of Philippians. I was going to take you to a few other places from Philippians, but I think the Lord is taking me somewhere else. So let's go to 2 John, 2 John, verse 4. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. We are commanded to walk in the truth, brothers, sisters. Walk in the truth. And now I ask you, dear lady, is this... First one says, the elder to the elect lady and her children. Is the elect lady the church, the bride of Christ? Are we her children? Starting at four again, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. And there are only, there are only some of the church's children today walking in the truth. Not, not many. 
just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning. that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Oh, man. You mean love isn't this gushy feeling, this thing I can make up and say it's whatever I want it to be? You mean love means walking according to God's commandments? What? Are you kidding me? Love means walking according to God's commandments. Jesus said the law and the prophets are summed up in two things. Love God with all your soul, with all your heart, with all your mind. and love your neighbor as yourself. And I will start here in verse six again. This is 2 John verse six. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. So love is to walk in God's commandments, to walk in Christ's commandments. Does that mean that I put myself back under all the Old Testament law and then have to fulfill all of those things like uh, sacrificing animals, eating uh, certain food, abstaining, for example, from pork, from shrimp, uh, wearing certain clothes, uh, having tassels on my clothes, things like that. Does it mean that I have to submit to all of those laws? No, we have to interpret the Old Testament laws in light of the scripture. And Paul makes it very clear that we do not have to abide by those, including even the Sabbath. I believe the Sabbath was Saturday. Uh, the Jews celebrate their Sabbath on Saturday. Paul said, that we can celebrate the Sabbath when we want to. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 says there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. But what is that Sabbath rest? Why is the Sabbath so important? Too much for me to get into here. Let me say that I observe the Sabbath, but I do not observe Saturday but I am a very strong believer in keeping the Sabbath. But the commandments, all of the moral commandments, and the commandment to love God, and to not have idols, and to not use the Lord's name in vain, to not steal, to not kill, to not commit adultery, to not lie, to not covet, all of those remain, and all of those all of those are reiterated by Paul. It's very clear that we are to obey those commandments of God and that when we disobey those and when we get into filthy things like pornography, like homosexuality, like adultery, when we get into filthy things, when we watch filthy things, listen to filthy things, do filthy things, we have sinned and we are not walking in truth. We are not walking according to the way of Christ. It must be understood and that almost the entire church has failed. But a lot of the church that didn't perhaps get into those sins they failed in another way by becoming so legalistic that unless you followed their rules, like for example, not smoking a cigarette, you couldn't fellowship with them anymore. Do you think Jesus cares if you smoke a cigarette? I think he cares if you smoke so much that you get sick, 
you get cancer if you're addicted. But there are things that we have made laws that God never made a law. What about drinking a glass of wine? Oh, can't do that. Are you kidding? Jesus clearly drank wine. Why do you think they called him a drunkard? Because he was drinking wine with people who drank wine. What did he turn the water into? Real wine, the best wine, better than any they had. The doctrines of the church are nuts in so many ways. And it's time. It's time to come out of the deception of 2,000 years of false Christian doctrine. It's time to come out. And that's what the seamless garment is all about. And that's what you'll be learning when you listen to these teachings. Now let me go on. Verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. That's so big, I'm not even going to start on that one right now. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ or the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And we have churches with signs that say everyone welcome. And we bring in every heresy, every sin, every false doctrine, and we don't correct it. We don't preach the truth. John said, don't even let them in your house if they don't have this doctrine, if they don't have this teaching. What's the teaching? That we walk in Christ's commandments. What is love? To walk in Christ's commandments. Don't make up love. Don't just say you love somebody and then be willy-nilly letting them act however they want. Oh, I, I can't confront them because I love them. Don't be a fool. Do you hear me? Don't be a fool. Now, back to Philippians. Starting at 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. What's the cross of Christ? I just told you from the book of John, 2 John. Walking in the commandments of God. Many Christians are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Many Christians are enemies of the truth of God. Many enemies, many Christians are enemies of the doctrine of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body. Will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. What? To be like God? Oh, heresy. A God maker. To be like God. Oh, Paul, how could you say it? Do you see how we've been deceived? 
we have accepted as truth so much that is not biblical because we don't read the Bible. Let me tell you something. There's a great heresy going around right now, and that is that the Bible was tampered with. Let me tell you, what we have is the Bible. What we have is a seamless garment. Why was it important that Jesus wore a seamless tunic? Why is that even in the scripture? What does it mean? Like everything, it's prophetic. Like everything, it's a parable. It tells that the word of God, what we have in the Bible, in the scripture, is also seamless. I can go anywhere in the Bible and tell you this story I'm telling you today. I can start in any book, Old Testament, New Testament. I can tell you the gospel from any book because the Bible is a seamless garment. It tells the same story over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And, over. and we don't get it. We, we just don't get it. We're going to begin to get it. God is beginning to reveal the truth of his seamless garment to the church, to Christians, to his people, and he will be drawing many in. Let me read that last two verses of Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. All things. To subject all things to himself. You've always heard Jesus is a great failure, that 99.9% .9 of the world are going to be cast into hell forever and burn in eternal torment. Are you kidding? Is that the kind of God we serve? Did he come and die so that he could take pleasure in sending billions to hell? Why do we believe this stuff? It's insanity. Almost every doctrine the church has believed is wrong. Almost every doctrine. People don't even really respect Jesus because they're just buddy buddy with him. You know, he'll just accept them where they're at and, and maybe even go and partake of that sin with them. Jesus, the most reviled man in history. Why is he reviled? Because he demands perfection. And Satan offers an easy way out. Do your own thing. Call sin what you want it to be. Or not at all. Jesus died for your sins, therefore sin doesn't exist, does it? Make it easy. Do what you want. Don't get into controversy. Don't. Don't get riled up about anything. Let people be people. Let people be perverted. Let people be Sinful, insane, crazy, perverts, murderers, liars. Just let them be. 
Jesus said no. That's not what I created you to be. I created you to be like me. Perfect. Even as my Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus is the most reviled man in history. And that's why. I urge you to continue watching this channel for new videos. I believe that the Lord is going to have me begin teaching the word again. And what I will be teaching, you have never heard. Grace and peace be with you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our God, our King.